I'm going to start with a little article that came out this week. It has to do with antitrust. Okay, and again, this has to do with extinction because it has to do with the possible, what I think is going to happen, the economic collapse. Okay, and this is all related to that. I think it's going to go through the realm of economics. I think that's what's going to happen. Okay, and so that's our argument here. Okay, so here's the first one. Okay, you want me to read these? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and read them? Germany opens antitrust probe against Apple. Germany uh -huh. and France have joined calls from the United States to impose a global minimum corporate tax of at least 15%, a move which targets multinationals like Amazon and Google. Yeah, and you can see uh, right at the bottom it says um, Germany that it's going to go against Amazon, Google, and Facebook. They've already begun uh, actions against these companies. And so the, the first question is, you know, whether this is going to continue. Are they going to go after all these big companies, uh, isn't that uh, anti-capital? Maybe it's antitrust, but it's anti-capitalism. It's like, you know, these people made it up there. They, they made their money. Should we go in there and uh, do something to them? And here you have another case, and that's got to do with Facebook. And Facebook, instead, in the United States, won its case against the government. Here it is, okay? Facebook wins antitrust dismissal. Sir, uh surges to $1 trillion value. <laughs> Critics of Facebook said the rulings highlight the need to revise antitrust laws for the internet age. You're saying that they're coming out with new laws against monopolies. Yeah, and um, yeah, what you're seeing is that they're going after companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple, um, possibly uh, Instagram. I, I heard that as well. So they're going after these big uh, octopuses. They have their tentacles everywhere, right? And the question is, uh, well, there's several questions. The first one is whether we should do that. Is, is that better for humankind or not? You know, or uh, are they at fault? Are these companies at fault? Or they're just doing their thing and they grew big because no one really um, stopped them. And then you have the, the issue of whether this constant concentration of power, economic power influence, uh, conduces to, in some way, to extinction. Does it accelerate our extinction? If we break them up, like, you know, here you have the case. Is it sustainable, I guess? Yeah, here you have a case of um, 19, I think 1984. Ah, let me get it up here. And this was the breakup of AT&T. They broke them up in all these regions, and they're known as the baby bells today. Well, they were known in those days. I don't know if anyone remembers that anymore. But they were known as the baby bells because they broke up uh, Bell Telephone in, you know, several pieces. And you can see they have all these regions now. And the question is, are they going to be doing this also with... Um, uh, with these big companies like Facebook and Amazon and so on. I mean, look at Amazon. Amazon has gone out there and also uh, began, got into the business of delivery. So they're no, use, they're no longer using what they consider their competitors now, which is, uh, you know, companies like FedEx and uh, USP and so on. Uh, now they're doing their own deliveries. And, you know, what are they going to go into next? I mean, restaurants and hotels and what is this, Monopoly? <laughs> the game of Monopoly, I buy a uh, boardwalk and park place and start charging money. I mean, I mean what is it? <laughs> eventually, someone ends, ends up with all the property, right? Well, it looks like that. Isn't I mean, it inevitable that you have to build in antitrust laws just for sustainability's sake? Well, I, we got two things here. The first one is there there is some amount of competition among the big guys, okay? So at some point, Amazon is going to collide with Apple, which is going to collide with Facebook, which is going to collide with Instagram. So these big corporations are might collide, more than likely will collide at some point if they keep extending their tentacles, like, you know, you have car companies, you know, Ford and GM and so on, well, they're competing. And so uh, is, is that a valid competition? Is that what we call competition? Or, I mean, uh, we, Amazon's we, got eBay. Well, this is what I was getting to, which we talked a little bit about today with Hans, and that's that if you put your little old uh, company, a car company, you start in your garage, right? Can you today build a company as big as Ford or, Am or um, uh, General Motors? I mean, you start your little company, right? Do you think you could eventually compete against these big guys? Or, or, is, or is that already forbidden forever? You know, and if it's forbidden forever, does the fact that there are four or five, maybe 10 companies in the world, I don't know how many there are, car companies that are competing amongst themselves, Mitsubishi and, and whoever, Hyundai and so on. I mean, this competition among giants, is that true competition? Or should we get more little guys out there and have, you know, 500 companies or 1,000 companies, car companies? How should you do this? What is the optimal amount of companies? There we go. And and that applies to any... One is the, is the bad answer. We know that much. <laughs> One means monopoly means they can do whatever they want. They have too much power. There's no checks and balances. Two, yeah. is that enough? 
or do they just end up shaking hands well, and imagine, working together? Well, just stop there. Stop at two. I mean, if we had two monsters, you know, out there in whatever business you can think of, there's only two in the world. Is that true competition? The Republicans and the Democrats. Kind of like that. I mean, <laughs> or should or should we or should we break whatever industry, whatever uh, line item? Uh, should we break those up in I don't know uh, 100,000 or maybe not that much but 1000 is is 1000 better than 2 wouldn't they work their way up to 2 again <laughs> kind of the issue. I mean what is the the end goal of competition monopoly <laughs> yeah. you try to eliminate the competition okay uh getting back to a little bit closer to extinction here we have um okay. another article that came out okay uh, someone pointed it out to me What's and, this about? And uh, this is about the Permian extinction. So it's cause of the worst mass extinction ever found. Oh, it's got to do with a Permian extinction. Huh? Let me read these. Yeah, yeah, hold it, hold it. But uh, this is the issue. The issue is we have, uh, there was a mass extinction about 252 million years ago. And uh, that's known as the biggest mass extinction because close to 90% of the species disappeared from the face of the earth. And so they say, what the hell happened? And so these guys say the following. They say uh, that, you know, these are, the, these are the mechanisms they propose, the causes. A new study reveals what caused most life on Earth to die out during the End Permian extinction, also known as the Great Dying. Well, that's a cool title. Yeah, Great Dying. Um, yeah, it's known as a cemetery. <laughs> great Dying. <laughs> the study suggests a volcanic eruption in Siberia spread aerosolized nickel particles that harmed organisms on the planet. I guess a volcano shot out nickel particles everywhere. Yeah, but see, this nickel, is the, mechan the specific mechanism here it comes. Nickel is an essential trace metal for many organisms, but an increase in nickel abundance would have driven an unusual surge in productivity of meth methanogens, microorganisms that produce methane gas. Increased methane would have been tremendously harmful to all oxygen-dependent life. Uh, so there's too much meth. Everyone's farting too much. Well, not only that, but now see because they they have already <laughs> had the, they already had um, this volcanic activity. You know that's what's being uh, ascribed to or you know attributed to um, to the Permian, the end Permian, because there was a mid Permian also extinction, quite quite big mass extinction. But this is the end Permian, 252 million years ago. Uh, this is the age of the Gorgonops and all these uh, uh, pariah SARS and so on. These animals that uh, were like mammal-like. If you look at them, they're mammal-like reptiles. If you look at them, they look like tigers and lions. But when you dissect them and open them up, they're reptiles. <laughs> they lay eggs. <laughs> As, imagine a lion laying eggs. That's more or less what you got here. Big bird. Yeah, yeah. And so, so the issue here is these animals disappear. And the question is, and they've had the idea that volcanic activity was behind that. Okay, they've had this for a long time already. Now they're going to the nitty gritty. And these people are saying, oh, it was the nickel that came out of volcanoes or whatever. Uh, does that make any sense? Are, are we making any progress on extinction at all? These people are going out there looking for evidence. They don't have a valid theory. They have an idiotic theory. That's the correct uh, qualifier. They have an idiotic theory, and they're just looking for evidence to certify their, their theory. Is that the way it should work? Or should we lay back, erase the board, and try, try to think how the animals could have died? Is that a better way of doing it, or, or is it going to be based on evidence? And this guy has this little piece of evidence. He said, no, no, it was an asteroid. The other guy said, no, well, I don't think so. I think it was a volcano. And the other guy said, no, I think it was disease. There's or... tons of evidence. And you can yeah. come up with any theory that's right. plausible, but none of them really explain selectivity. Although if you're talking about 90%, then, I mean, the selectivity, there's not that much selectivity going on in 90%. That one could have been an asteroid. No, know. no, there is selectivity. Yeah. Remember, yeah, because there is selectivity because that 10% of the animals that survived that didn't fall it's within species. Well, no. What they what happened next? They radiated and they created the new species of animals, which were the uh, um, what is it? The uh, the, the uh, archosaurs. Okay, so they were like uh, crocodiles. That some of them supposedly walked on two legs. You know, they kind of like the dinosaurs. They were already rising a little bit, and so they're looking for evidence of that nature. They found, in fact, they found some evidence of that in South Korea. Uh, in some kind of mountain out there, and they found footprints, 100 footprints preserved for millions of years, and they found these footprints, and, and by studying the footprints, they said, look, these were, uh, these were archosaurs, but, you know, usually an animal steps on his own footprint, on the front footprint, you know, and so like the lion, if you look at the lion, uh, they filmed this very carefully, puts his uh, hind leg exactly where he put his front leg, exactly, I mean, it's like, he's got it calculated, uh, his is because he's got to be very careful not to, uh, you know, uh, scare whatever prey he's after. So he's very cautious in the way he walks, and so is a tiger, and so on. And these animals, they say it's the same thing. You don't see the four paws on the on the ground. You see like two, 
you know, bipedal animal. And uh, we're the only bipedal animal we know <laughs> pretty much, you know, there's a couple more out there and that's it. And so they say that these archosaurs were the first to stand on two legs. And then from there, one branch probably perhaps branched out into the dinosaurs, you know, the, the T-Rex with the little yeah, hands I'm thinking, here. I'm thinking Velociraptors <laughs> from Jurassic Park. Yeah, in fact, uh, all these uh, Velociraptors and uh, T-Rexes and so on, you know, the, um, who has a Robert Baker, one of the paleontologists out there, which comes up with uh, interesting theories. He said, uh, you know, we got the wrong idea. He was the first to propose it, as far as I know, uh, that uh, these were not cold-blooded reptiles. Mm -hmm. They were hot-blooded chickens. <laughs> Yeah. I mean that kind of ruins yeah. the uh, scary like <laughs> it's a big chicken. That's what that's what a dinosaur the chickens is. Chickens are coming. <laughs> it's a two-legged chicken. In fact, the, the feet look more like chickens than any reptile, you know, if you look at it. Anyways, uh that's what you find in the uh, Permian from this article. Here's a from the same uh, source, this is the Triassic. Okay, and again, uh, look at the theories that these people are proposing. And uh, again, said so rock study may have just revealed cause of Triassic mass extinction. Big titles. Does that make it's any the, sense? Clickbait titles. Yeah, it's a... a new study suggests that the mass extinction that gave dinosaurs the evolutionary upper hand was caused by oceanic oxygen deprivation. In other words, uh, in the other one, it was also, uh, what was it nickel just being sprayed into the air and causing, uh, you know, certain um, gases to form that this... killed animals in the land and in the seas. Here we have what also related to some gas, in this case, mm -hmm. oxygen. And they're saying, you know, there's uh, oxygen depletion. You know, so so there's not enough air, and so some of the animals, I guess, gasp to that's death. The, that's the thing. These are always <laughs> these like wide like area of effect kind of uh, effects. So everything in that area should die. Really, why is it leaving the small things alive? Yeah, and and if you look at uh, it says sixty percent of plant species also died. That's kind of coincidental that the plant species also died. Uh, oh, did they die because some gas was out there? Why didn't they all die? And it turns out that what died, again, it's uh, what I always uh, want you to look for, is it was a chronological extinction. What died were the old plants and the old animals. What survived were the new plants and the new animals. If, if you look at that, you'll see that in every mass extinction, no exceptions. Okay, so it's 100% uh, that old plants and old animals die, and the ones that have been around for a long time, and uh, the ones that survive are the new ones, the ones that radiate right after the extinction. That had nothing to do with what? With their food chain. And there you can see the... Uh, the causes what is it climate change asteroid impacts volcanoes <laughs> that's it so that's all they can think of and that uh, you know it's uh, always the uh, environment uh, yeah. explosions and here's uh one site uh another site but again this is a site known as thought coal okay and, then, and there's it, the big three and meteor, climate and yeah. volcanic <laughs> same thing that's all they can propose and so uh, I just want to make sure people understand uh, that we have something a little different. That's what we propose. Okay. Here we have the overturning of the demographic uh, pyramid for plants. You mean this is the theory you propose? Yeah, this before. is my theory. I'm saying uh, what happened was over time, um, the plants that have been around for millions of years, finally, you know, they give up their genetic diversity, their population pyramid overturns. You start having fewer and fewer of these plants. They are old plants. That means that they are not as sophisticated as the new ones. The new one, yeah, the new ones, uh, for example, when we went to, from spores to cones, cones spread faster than spores and, and to a wider range. And then when the angiosperms came around, uh, they replaced the, the cones, in other words, conifers, the um, um, uh, gymnosperms. Did you call it new technology? <laughs> yeah, in, in a certain sense, if you compare, you know, even today, if you compare the conifers against the angiosperms, the angiosperms beat the hell out of them because they have encased seeds. So this uh, seed can last longer out there without it being um, destroyed by the environment, by environmental uh, conditions or whatever, or an animal eating it. On the other hand, the cone lasts less, and the spore is even more primitive. So we went from, from first uh, uh, non-vasculars, and we went from those to, um, uh, to um, what is it, uh, ferns, which uh, work primarily with spores. There were some seed ferns as well. Then we went to um, uh, conifers and finding with angiosperms. So, so Mother Nature improved her way of, um, of reproducing plants. And so when one plant uh, was dying because it was already at the end of its life, it uh, exhausted its genetic diversity. And on top of it, it's got this big competitor next to it that's uh, you know, taking over the land. What happens to the animals that depended on that source of food for mm -hmm. millions of years? Mm -hmm. And that's the second part there. The, the the first part has to do with a background extinction, meaning it's a uh, genetic and population 
uh, extinction. Whereas the second one has to do with an ecological uh, extinction, which, which follows. The yeah, because it means that now the herbivores don't can't find as much food. They can't find these. They're stuck on an island, and the island is shrinking on them. I call it the shrinking island. Uh, they're stuck on some island, some forest, uh, some jungle, and they're eating whatever they eat. But that jungle is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. The animals are becoming bigger and bigger and bigger from and that, as a result of Koch's law, as it's known, that over time animals get bigger and bigger, especially through this competition. You know, the T-Rexes didn't come uh, on Earth like uh, like God put them for the first uh, day, like when they re uh, disappeared. No, the T-Rexes were animals that over time they grew and grew and grew big. Why? Because they were in a competition against uh, hadrosaurs and ankylosaurs and against uh, um, uh, what other animal? Uh, and against uh, the uh, what is it? The the horn ones? Triceratops. <laughs> the uh, triceratops. You know these animals were growing bigger, especially triceratops, which in uh, Montana, you know, Hell Creek, Montana. Um, that's where the big fight between T. Rexes and, and <laughs> Triceratops. Like had, a war. Yeah, it was a war. The it was, it was, a, it was a, <laughs> like the United States and Russia. You know, this guy builds one weapon, the other guy builds another. It's, a, it's an arms race. And so this guy becomes bigger, the other guy becomes bigger, and over time they grew. But, I want to watch that movie. <laughs> the T -Rex well, you got to wait two, three million years. Let's go to war, man. <laughs> yeah, but it's a two, three million year movie. Oh, yeah, it's not. <laughs> I don't really think you want to wait. You got to watch it in, in times 10 speed. <laughs> okay, so uh, here it is. Uh, oh. you, you can see, you can see um, uh, how this progressed. What are, we, what are we looking at? What we're looking at here, the uh, Paleozoic, the Mes Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. And what, what you see here is that when we started out, we started out with, you know, right at the very bottom in the Devonian, you've got uh, Tiktaalik there, that little uh, animal that just was somewhat like a lungfish. It could live in the water and also in, in, in uh, on land. Like That's one, one of the first uh, animals that came out onto land. They say it's Tiktaalik or, you know, some of its cousins. And then by the time you get uh, into the Carboniferous, you, you start seeing uh, the world of amphibians and they ruled the world at the time they, they were the kings okay and then after that you got you know the uh, um, pelagosaurs okay you got the uh, big sailbacks okay like dimetrodon and uh, uh, edaphosaurus and some some of those animals and and then uh, from there they worked uh, midway into the permian the second half uh, those animals disappeared and what continued were these uh, uh, therapsids and from there, they, uh, they moved on to these uh, thecodonts, the uh, archosaurs, and so on. From there, they moved on to dinosaurs, and there were two types of dinosaurs, the ones that were in the Jurassic, the ones that were in the, in the uh, Cretaceous. They were different kinds of dinosaurs. Okay? So if you look, you'll see uh, that very different types of um, dinosaurs. And I say that that's got a lot to do with the foods that they ate, in part. In other words, when they radiated, they radiated with the radiation of food as well, in other words, uh, the plant life. And based on that, those animals that could make the most of that plant life were the ones that grew and became the big monsters of the Jurassic. When they all died, a new um, branch of dinosaurs continued. They had different types of food. They grew, they the also ones occupied. The new stuff. Well, they, yeah, they, they uh, radiated with uh, new types of plants, and they grew into different types of uh, animals in general. Essentially yeah. two different food chains. Yeah. Well, the and, old food chain goes dying right. because the plants die off, and then that, that from the bottom up, the chain kind of dissolves. And while that's all going on, the new food chain slowly has more room to grow. So and, they get bigger. They and get you can bigger. see that uh, there's a difference between dinosaurs of the Cretaceous versus the ones in the Jurassic, just like there are differences in the mammal-like reptiles of the Permian. You know, a theropod is not the same thing as a pelicosaur. And, and they were very different types of animals in many ways. Especially, you can see just uh, one's got a sail bag and looks more like a reptile, and the other guy looks more like a lion. So, so they were different kinds of animals. But the ones, the, the second group, the theropods, they came out of the first guys. Okay? And then towards the right, you see the mammals. And we started around the Jurassic. We were tiny animals throughout the Jurassic. Uh, there I put two examples, the Megazostrodon and Purgatorius uh, in the Cretaceous. And these animals supposedly, not these specific animals, uh, sometimes uh, the paleontologists uh, like to exaggerate and say we came out of these. No, no, it was some cousin of this, these guys that were parallel to, to these guys. These are the guys we see in the rock, but there, got, there had to be lots of other mammals out there uh, that eventually turned into the ones that radiated once the dinosaurs were gone. And so this is in general terms, the big picture. And just, I'm looking here at only at the animals on land. And here you see uh, in, in a bigger picture, in fact, you can see probably a better picture of what really happened. Uh, what happened throughout the ages. You have 
Uh, there again, you see Tick Talik on the total to the left. This is the history of life on Earth. Yeah, this is the history of life on Earth. And these are just samples for each age. You can see that there were different types of animals throughout the period. But I wanna, what I want to point out is that what happened to the plants. And you can see that uh, the age of amphibians is, thought, is uh, related to the non-vascular and early vasculars. Then the Permian Triassic, or the age of seed ferns in general terms. Triassic is also known for uh, some of the uh, or, uh, cycads that came out. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, there's a specific seed firm also that uh, I think was very important throughout uh, those days. And um, uh, what was the name of it? I forgot. <laughs> I forget the name. I'll remember in a minute. Um, uh, oh, dichrodiums. That's, that's what their names. Anyways, then uh, they moved uh, into the Jurassic and Cretaceous, the age of dinosaurs, we call them. And these were the age of uh, gymnosperms, uh, different types of gymnosperms in Jurassic than in Cretaceous. Okay, you see different types of plants. Um, and by the time we get to our uh, era, uh, you know, all the conifers and the um, ferns, all these, all these plants, they become a small part of the landscape. And today it's almost all angiosperms. I don't know how much there is. I think 75% of the planet has angiosperm, especially with humans, you know, specifically planting these things. You know, we're, we're uh, muscling aside all the other uh, types of plants that we have no use for other than for beauty, <laughs> for, for beautiful landscapes. So this is in general terms what happened. And what I'm saying, you can see that when certain plants died, the animal died. Like I showed a minute ago in the Triassic, 60% of the, or I think it was the um, Permian, I can't remember which two right now, but 60% of the plants died. Like, isn't that a clue of something? If the plants die, the, the herbivore is going to die, right? That depended on that plant. And what you will see is that at every mass extinction, there's always, always a massive plant extinction, a plant, a type of plant, an order of plants that existed or thrived through millions of years and then suddenly, you know, whittled away and finally died. And what happens to the animals that forged their relationship with that? Uh, they're gone. <laughs> and with them, the, the uh, carnivores that hunted them. They go to the fridge and there's nothing there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, someone mentions this. Uh, well, this is, uh, this is the introduction. Okay, let me go with the introduction first. This is what I said the other day, and I'll just go briefly through it. A seller is a person who what? Who gives. And was a buyer, a person who receives, period. And, and the rest of the predicate there should be removed. Uh, because when, when we say a buyer, uh, we're, not insinu we're insinuating that um, he's giving something in exchange, but it's, that's not very clear. What is absolutely clear is that he's going to receive something. That's what we call a buyer. Buyer is the guy who receives something. If he gave something, he's a seller. What's okay? the context here? Well, the context here is that, uh, I'll get to the context. Uh, we start with this, okay. saying these are the definitions. Seller is a giver, buyer is a receiver. This, Why do, this is a weird segue from the dinosaurs. Yeah, I, I had to, well, yeah, because it's got to do with, uh, remember, the extinction, uh, the economic collapse. Okay, yeah, that's okay. What it's, where we headed. Okay, and so here we have, we distinguish between a buyer and a seller because one has to do with capitalism, the other one has to do with uh, communism. What is communism? Well, a receiver who doesn't give. And what is a capitalism? A giver who a giver who does receive. Okay, if you have a receiver who who doesn't give, we call it communism. You have a giver who doesn't receive, we call it communism again. What's a giver who doesn't? Receive? Well, again, that's why I defined a, a seller and buyer not as someone who You're trades. You're just talking about where the goods go. Yeah, and I'm just saying one guy just receives, the other guy gives. Otherwise, if the guy gives something for something, we call him a seller. We don't call him a, a, a receiver or a, or. A, uh, what is it? A, uh, a, a a buyer. Okay. So okay. So that's the context. And so the reason I raise this is because someone, a couple people, uh, ask questions regarding this. Okay. And so let me put this up here. And this is what the person says. We trade seller seller. Yeah, because I mentioned that uh, trade is seller seller. There's no buyer. But might I suggest the word producer? Right. All free independent men are expected to produce for their own benefit slash self-interest. Those who cannot depend on the generosity, love, or voluntary commitment of those who can give. Uh -huh. And another person doubles up on that, also talking about producer, and Pro says, Producers are gatherers <laughs> who are engaging in trade, selling what they have. Okay, so these are uh, what people propose. Maybe we should call them producers. And I don't know, I... I, I don't like the word producer. Let me tell you why. Here it is. Okay, this is my take on this. Okay, producer versus parasite. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna put, uh, compare a producer okay. versus a parasite. Okay. Okay. And and here we have a specific case. My own son, Hans. Uh -oh. Let me put him up there again for a second. Okay, that's him. And it turns out, you know, when when uh, he was young, you know, he would come to me and say, uh, Dad, give me allowance. Give me twenty dollars uh, allowance. And I said, What? 
twenty dollars. I'm not gonna give you a penny. Never did. And he says, okay, then uh, I'm gonna bug you all day. I'm gonna make your life miserable today. And it's what I call, you know, the. Uh... <laughs> uh, and so uh, here we have what I call the allowance. Tony says you need protection theory, which is if you don't give him money, he's gonna bug you all day and cry and you know do all kinds of, and you know throw a fit. So uh, so I call it the allowance theory or the Tony says you need protection. So the guy's not producing anything, but you got to give him money because otherwise he breaks the windows of your shop. Are whatever. we just categorizing forms of making money or what? No, that? well, well, here, let, let me show you uh, this. I'm getting to that last line. That's going to clarify it, I think, uh, completely. First, I want to mention that producer is not a seller, which is what these people are proposing. They're saying, uh, why don't you use the word producer instead of seller? Oh. Well, because you have one carpenter the, that yeah. comes. One is the farmer who makes the fruit, and then there's the guy who sells it, or what? No, no, that's one issue, because if, if, uh, if I'm a farmer and I give it to a seller, I'm selling it too. But this is the issue. If I'm a carpenter that makes a table for myself, then I'm, uh, I'm a producer, but I'm not a seller. Am I selling to myself? Well, what does that mean? Or uh, a subsistence farmer, he produces, he, he has a garden or whatever, and just produces for his own consumption. Is that a uh, seller? So a producer is not a seller, so I don't think we can replace the word seller directly with the word producer. Then there's the other issue, and it's the issue of parasites. There are all kinds of parasites. There's people who can't, there's people who can but won't, and there's people who can't <clears throat> but can't. Parasite is pretty strong. Okay, so okay. so let's go through each one. <laughs> Person who can, maybe a quadriplegic or someone who um, is on life support. He's there. He's alive. But he can't. He can't do. Or he's a child. He can't produce anything uh, worthwhile. Okay. Then you have the those that can but won't. And I was thinking of the Queen of England <laughs> and uh, Freddie the Freeloader, uh, Red Skelton, who used to do that bit. You know, the bum who just begs and doesn't give anything in return, uh, especially work or anything at all. And then you have those that can but can't. And those are the people who want to work and can't find work because the economy does not allow for it. Okay, and here you have uh, this was happened in the uh, uh, depression. Why can't yeah. you give my dad a job? That's what I keep asking. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so we have all these situations. So I don't think we can replace the word um, seller with the word producer. And then we have to distinguish people who are parasites but are not parasites of their own free will. Okay, there are those who don't want to work and don't care, especially now that all this COVID money is out there. Hey, people are, a lot of people are happy and they don't want to even go back to work, uh, a lot of them, and that's one issue. But then there's a lot of people who, for whatever reasons, they can't work, They're, uh, they have physical problems or whatever, and then there are those who want to work and they can't find work. Okay, and so there's, there's a mixture there, and so you have to be careful with the word producer here as well because there are people who want to produce, and you might treat them as a bum because you say, well, you're not producing. Well, yeah, because I can't because either, uh, you know, you have a physical problem or you can't find a job. Is that that person's fault? You know, I mean, there's one job, 10 people apply, nine people are going to be out of a job, that sort of thing. And you can't always cover 10, uh, 100%. In fact, um, for as long as we can remember, unemployment is part of every economy in the world, whether a communist or, or capitalist, there's always a percentage of unemployment. And that unemployment has to be uh, um, sustained with welfare, some kind of welfare, socialism or whatever. There's no other way. And that person otherwise, you know, has to go out there and, you know, buy a gun with whatever money he's got. <laughs> so, you know, just keep all these things in mind. Okay. Okay, moving on here. Uh, here we go. One guy says, Bitcoins, uh, cryptocurrency. These scam coins are getting crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, someone just showed me this one and he goes through how many millions of each one of these coins there are and some of them are unlimited, have no cap and so on. Um, yeah, Bitcoin is, I think, uh, simply the new currency that's out there. Okay. And here you, um, today I pulled this out. This, these are the 10 most popular coins. Uh, there's hundreds of them now and these are all crypto coins. You can see that the trends are going up. So a lot of people are getting into this market. I guess this uh, Bitcoin, or I call them Bitcoin, but it's cryptocurrency, uh, in general is going to go up. Maybe it's a good time to buy because these are all pyramids, meaning that it's expected that more and more people will enter, buy the coin, and, and take the prices upwards. And so right now, maybe it's a good time to get into this. Don't take my advice just in case, but it's just something for you to ponder, you know. Uh, in fact, the other day, I got into the Bitcoin market. I bought some uh, uh, Dogecoin. You know, I bought uh, just just to play around, just to find out what it would do, you know, put my money where my mouth is. And I bought $150 worth of uh, Dogecoin and it went up to 300 bucks and then I sold. So I made twice my money. <laughs> if someone would have done the same thing with, I don't know, a million bucks, he would have had two million bucks and so on. So maybe now this time and now's the time to get into crypto for those of who, you who want to bet. Who, who you like still gambling. have those coins, don't you? You're trying to raise the market. <laughs> 
Yeah, I don't think I can <laughs> manipulate the market too much with 150 bucks. But uh, we're gonna go up to 450, and we keep talking. Yeah, that's who are people like Elon Musk, you know, who could put in there a billion bucks and then sell it the next day and have the market go <laughs> soon. Up we'll have 500. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, maybe it's a good time for you to consider. But my point here is that crypto, yeah, is is um, I think it's the new currency. It might replace. I don't know if it will, but it might replace the old currency, which is uh, fiat money or or even checking accounts, which is kind of like an abstraction. Did dinosaurs They're, have crypto? Yeah, they they did. Is they this a sign it, of the end times? It was the rock market <laughs> when Fred the rock Flintstone. market collapsed. Yeah, Fred Flintstone. Yeah, oh, poor dude. Okay, uh, another issue here um, says has uh, has Bill explained the selectivity problem re -dinos? Re -dinos. Yeah, regarding, oh, regarding dinos. dinos. Mm -hmm. I mean, some species would have adapted better than others to what? Well, uh, to the environment. In other words, if there are climate change and food changes, for example, you know, uh, one usually dependent on the other. What this fellow is saying, I guess, is if the climate changes and the food changes, well, the big guys die, okay, uh, because they cannot adapt fast enough. Why not? Uh, well, again, you got to explain the mechanism, yeah. but they just uh, say that's the theory. Okay. In other words, with, it's the conclusion without p putting in a mechanism. They're just saying the big guys die because they suck at adapting. Yeah, and the, question, the ones that suck at adapting happen to and, die. And the issue there that I always have, uh, which is important, is you know, uh, forget about the big guys. Any animal, take a rabbit. He's eating lettuce. He loves lettuce, or any of these little, you know, these plants that he eats every day. Can this rabbit switch over to ferns or conifers? Can he start eating pine trees tomorrow? I'm sure they try. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you that they can't. You know, in <laughs> fact, uh, um, uh, I read once that uh, horses, when they eat by mistake, some of these conifers, uh, they get either sick or die. They, they, it really affects them because they're not used to this kind of uh, plant, first of all. And second, I don't think they have the bacteria, the proper bacteria in their bodies to, to you know, uh, digest, uh, to digest this kind of uh, food. They, Anyways, they just get stuck with rocks in their stomach. It's a second part that uh, inter that uh, he was really after. Many smaller species would have lost larger predators. As for plants, they'd have winners and losers too. Yeah, in other words, this fellow is saying that uh, the small species, right? Once the big guy, once the big guys, well, let me, let, yeah, let me, let me get this uh, here. Uh, once the big guys are out of the way, he says, well, uh, that that would explain why the little guys survived. And to a point, he's he's right. The question is whether they're part of the same food chain. And the way I get to this is through uh, my fable uh, of the lion and the fly. Okay, and so here's the fable of the lion and the fly. Okay, and so here we have a lion. Let me put it over here. <laughs> I think we don't have a lion. Here we have a, a lion, and he got sick and tired of chasing after a deer and so on. You Just know, the to cover my face. And so yeah, <laughs> and uh, so he started going after flies. Okay, well he found out that it was very hard to catch a fly. You know, there were lots of flies, but he couldn't catch a single one because they were so fast. And he could just grab them and eat them. And after a lot of uh, you know chasing it after around them, he finally caught one of them and he ate it, but it didn't satisfy him very much. And so he found out that not only did it didn't taste very good or as good as a buffalo, uh, that was one issue. The other one it took him a lot of energy, right, to <laughs> to catch one of these flies. It took him a lot of effort, and so it wasn't worth it for him. Now imagine imagine now you going back to the Cretaceous and you've got these. Uh, T-Rexes, right? Big or, uh, you know, any velociraptors or any of these. And, you know, and, and they're running around chasing after these mice, the purgatorias or any of these small uh, mammals that were there in those days. And I can imagine these little animals running around their feet like, like rats today running around our feet. Do you think uh, T-Rex would have the dexterity? You know, the swiftness to catch one of these guys. They're not built for the, catching them. First of all, that. Second, they probably didn't taste good any more than, a, you know, a bug would taste good for you. You know, do you, do you eat, generally eat uh, grasshoppers or cockroaches? Not typically. You you know, maybe it. someone does out there, but uh, not typically. You haven't seen Lion King, Pops? You know what happens in Lion King, right? Yeah. Uh, and Simba eats the freaking bugs. Yeah, I know. Because, <laughs> but this is the issue. The issue is... <laughs> I doubt very much I doubt very much the T-Rexes would spend the time to go after Purgatorius and his crew, uh, crew. First of all. Second, I doubt very much they could catch them. Maybe stomp on them. I don't know. By mistake. Potato and, chip. and then it's a potato chip and it doesn't fill them. No, he's not going to even waste time on these. Little, these are nuisances, you know, that are in the way. So this notion that the big guys left of a... When they left... That's why the little guys could expand. Well, they could expand. Yeah, that's one issue. But whether they were part of the same food chain, that's a separate issue. I don't think flies are part of the same food chain as lions. Okay, and similarly, similarly, I don't think that uh, mammals were part of the food chain of most uh, predators, uh, of dinosaurs. Right? Okay. Uh, another fellow says says 
There are people. There are people achieving self-sufficiency in urban environments by doing such things as aquaponics, a system that raises fish and plants, fertilizer with fish waste. Some uh, raise some chicken, pheasant, quail, small pigs in the backyard, feeding families of four easily. Yeah, uh, today. That's that's today. the difference. Today, today we can do that because we have the protection. We have protection from the law. We have the judges. We have the police. We have the air force. Everybody protects you. Okay, so we have this system that we've developed that we all agree upon we all well, most of us <laughs> uh, promise to follow and because we follow it then no problem we go in there and uh, you know um, we can plant we can plant successfully the issue here that uh, you got to answer is you know uh, can you do this when the global economy collapses and what you have is no 911 that's the, the issue is defense the issue is security uh, a thousand, and, and then there's there's a couple more issues which I raised the other day. I'll just mention them quickly and ask that first one person cannot um, uh, plant, I don't know, uh, 100 acres. Let's assume he can because he's got the right tools and machinery, the tractors, the combines, whatever he's got. Okay, he, he plants 100 acres. Can he defend 100 acres? Here you have thousands of people coming from the city. They're starving. There's food there in your in your great farm, your beautiful farm. You planted, took all this trouble to work and plant your field, and now they come and they start uh, pouncing upon your hundred acres. It doesn't have to be hundred acres, but you know, well, there's new technology where they do 3D planting yeah. where it goes up, so you can you save a lot of room. Yeah. Okay. So in an ideal vertical, world, vertical, vertical. I guess what we're saying is, in an ideal world, if everyone were really good at farming, we all had aquaponics and 3D. Uh, farming and whatnot and we're all super efficient maybe we could all just sustain our own food but i guess your uh counter to that is the transition between our world and that ideal world yeah well, I'm, re exist. I'm referring i'm referring to a normal to, world. Uh, to our world. right now we have a normal world yeah people can plant whatever they want they can do aquaponics or whatever they want I mean, to do not that many people know about it either. no no but assuming you know uh yeah there are people out there surviving with it, no problem but uh, uh, a lot of them are preppers. They're preparing for who knows what, but they're preparing for some catastrophe. But the issue here is that um, <laughs> uh, what happens when the global economy collapses? Let's assume that. We're going to make an assumption. Global economy collapses. There's no more money, uh, meaning no one produces more food except those who are qualified and have the land to do that. And so these people produce. You think anyone else is going to respect property after the global economy collapses? No, they're hungry people. They're desperate people. They, a lot of them have guns. They're going to go out there and just eat your farm alive. They're going to be the, like the locusts. They're just going to overrun your farm. What are you going to do? Shoot them all? Even assuming you shoot a lot of them, I don't think you can shoot them all. I don't think you can uh, patrol your whole land if you, because if you're going to be living for at least a year with all this food that you planted, you got quite a bit of land there just to feed yourself, let alone if you have more people in your group. And then again, you have to have a little group. They have to patrol the whole land. You have all these people from the city just swarming over your your farm with guns also i don't know if you can protect it the issue is protection there's no 911 after the global economic collapse uh, there is but they're not there to help you <laughs> no yeah <laughs> <laughs> they, if they come with guns uh, they're not there to uh, protect sir, you sir we <laughs> heard there was food here i mean a disturbance <laughs> okay uh Powell says those billionaires talking about living it on other planets, I assume, yeah. must be just gaming the idiots who fall for it to somehow make money. If not that, then they are just total retards. The true meaning of the word. What is the context here? Okay. You switch topics real quick. Yeah, no, because they're all related to extinction. Here, the, uh, the other day, we talked about leaving the planet so that we avoid extinction. And uh, Elon Musk said, you know, we, we have to become a more than one planet species. He said a multi-planet species. Carl Sagan says a, a two planet species and so on. Uh, Jeff Bezos says we, we should take all the machinery on Earth, all the factories, all the uh, <laughs> shoot, shoot and, take them, and take them to space or to the moon. We should use the moon for manufacturing and this should be a pristine garden. And so they have all these ideas. And uh, so uh, Elon Musk has this SpaceX program. He wants to go into Mars. The question is that if that's ever going to happen, where we have this uh, beautiful landscape here on Earth, and you're going to move to Mars voluntarily to live in these bubble cities, what I call bubble cities. Um, Looks cool. Uh, I don't think so. In the desert, maybe for one day visit, great. I mean, one week, whatever. If there's people there, then what's the difference? Well, the issue is that I don't know if people want to live there, first of all, but assuming, will this ever happen? Will anyone build cities on Mars? And these people are saying they will, that we have to. We have to do it before World War III, which is coming up probably. And so they're hurrying up. They said, we need to send someone into to Mars. Oh, and build we cities. all each other. Yeah, because if we nuke <laughs> each other here, at least we'll have a million people out there that can continue to propagate. You know what? I actually I have a counter to that. If we have a backup plan and there's people living on Mars, 
then <laughs> we're gonna then, go to Mars. No, no, no. But assuming we had people on Mars, right? That means we have the carte blanche to nuke each other. So isn't it better to just yeah. have one planet so that we all respect each other and not nuke each other? Like, hey guys, this is the only oh, planet okay, we yeah, have. That's good. I like let's, that. Let's yeah, not nuke yeah. each other because we don't have any backup planets. But yeah, if we had Mars, like, eh. Yeah, yeah, we can do this. They, one, right? they, they can continue. We can kill each other. Yeah, and uh, there's more than that. I mean, uh, do you want to live in a bubble city or do you want to have uh, a planet? I mean, if we could, like Sagan suggested, that we terraform Mars such that we can live on the surface without these bubbles protecting us, oh. without the suits, that we could just breathe. That's a problem already. First, because gravity is different there, and that means it's not going to hold the air to the surface of Mars as it is here. It's Therefore, the pressure, it's the pressure is lower, etc., etc., etc. There's many problems with living on Mars, even in an idealistic situation, let alone if we have to build these uh, artificial bubbles and build the cities within the bubbles. Uh, and where are we going to get all these supplies? Are we going to ship them from uh, Phobos and Damus, the moons of Mars? I thought we just kind of By the them. teaspoons? <laughs> so, no, I think this is all baloney. These people are talking nonsense, and so is NASA when NASA says, oh, we got to go out into outer space. Well, We're not going to go out there and live there. We're not going to call it. Can we explore? Yeah. Uh, to learn stuff or do some research, that's great. Are we actually going to colonize and live on Mars? Oh, that's a different well, hold story. Hold on, but I think this is, isn't this why you went into extinction theory in the first place? Because assuming we did live yeah. forever, like the species, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be a, a temporal uh, inevitability that eventually we would like overcrowd Earth and just be like, you know what, now we need more room. We're all suffering down here. Let's go to Mars. Yeah, I got into the extinction business because of relativity. Because book after book that I read, they all said, we're going to go out of the, uh, out of, uh, the Earth. We're going to go through, to, through the fourth dimension to another universe. They started talking about all this nonsense, this idiocy, you know, talking about wormholes and so on. And I said, what the hell is all this? And these people, and that's when I started analyzing, because until then I believed as well, or I had in the back of my mind, I never really uh, dealt with this uh, question in any depth. And so I casually just believed, yeah, we're going to conquer the planets. It's, it's almost automatic that at some point we're just going to go out of the Earth, conquer the planets, then conquer the stars and conquer the galaxy. Everyone kind of takes it like a matter of fact yeah. future thing. Like, well, not us, but eventually. Yeah, yeah, we leave it to the uh, future generation. It's going to happen. Like, and then I started analyzing and said, there's no way. <laughs> it's like me with my chores. Leave it up to, to tomorrow, me. <laughs> Procrastination? <laughs> yeah. ah, they'll do it. <laughs> so, uh, no, I, I started looking at it and said, there's no way we're going to Mars. Not to colonize. I mean, we might go to Mars to, to go around the send some robots, maybe some humans there that pull some rocks and bring them back, that sort of thing. No problem. They look at the landscape. They had a great vacation, maybe a month or so, and then they come but back. you're saying not to colonize. But colonize, that's a so totally different issue because now you got to take a lot of stuff there, which costs lots of money. Every trip costs yeah, yeah. gazillions of dollars. All the money. And it's, it's a cost issue. Right now we can't, you know, we're, we're dying as far as uh, extra money on Earth. Uh, a lot of poor people, they're going to have to sustain those people with welfare. That means it's going to take money out of somewhere. Okay, here's a question for you. There's not going to be any money for this. Here's a question. Assume, yeah. Assuming we did live, assuming there were no human uh, apocalypse coming, uh -huh. wouldn't, you're, you're saying we would prefer to live the rest of human existence here on Earth. Yeah. You're saying that's what also, we would choose. We would choose to The majority. Stay, Great majority. No, 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 Someone no. Might but I mean, I mean, you're saying it would never happen that we would build up enough resources to go to Mars. We, wouldn't be, we would build up enough resource, that's one issue. There's the technology part. Can we take all this stuff that we need over there in many trips? Again, maybe that could be an issue of money. But ultimately, it's an issue of money anyway, because there are more pressing issues here on Earth. And I'm sure uh, Congresses in every country, in Russia, in China, in the United States, they have better things to do with the money than to uh, create a colony somewhere where they're never going to go. You know, the take, senators doesn't and the, it just take one eccentric eccentric billionaire to just do it without anyone's consent? I think it takes a little more than that. Which two is, two right, eccentric right, billionaires. Yeah, we have that. We have that right now. We have people like yeah, Bezos and, and, and uh, what's his name? Uh, and um, uh, uh, I was going to say Trump. And, <laughs> but all these oh, rich guys, uh, are they going to pull all their money and create trillions of dollars and send many trips to Mars to build a colony yeah. on Mars when they're not going to go to Mars? Who are they going to send? It's just, it's are just, they send other isn't people? it just for posterity? Well, are they going to do it? it? Are they going to do it for other people? That's the question. It, for themselves, for posterity, to leave their Mars. Are they going to do that? Yeah. I don't think they will. Why not? If <laughs> no. they're bored, I, if I had a trillion bucks, I'd do it just to be the guy who did it. I what else think, you're gonna die anyway. You might as well do something with your trillions. Yeah, but uh, uh, what I, I think, disagree. Yeah, let, me t <laughs> let me let me tell you. Yeah, yeah, I overrule you. Don't worry. No, but one of the things I always say is, you know, you have all these um, philanthropists, uh, rich people, yeah. millionaires. They're all philanthropists. They say, I'm going to give half my money away. I'm going to give a quarter. I'm going to give seventy-five percent. 
Next year, they end up being always the richest people on earth. You say, how can they give so much money out? They're philanthropists. They're giving all this money away for free to this uh, project, to that other one over there. And they always end up always, always at the top of the, of the rich man's pile. So I, I think that a lot of these people are so-called philanthropists just to reduce their tax <laughs> I mean, uh, so they can declare uh, less taxes. I don't think there is any real philanthropy out there, or at least not significant. There is some, obviously, but I'm you, wondering you about how, how do they end up always being on the top uh, of the richest people on earth if they give so much of their money away? But isn't that obvious? That What's they, obvious? They, they don't give enough away ah. because they're not. Because well, they want to keep, keep being able to give away. But that's my point. My point is, if, if that guy really gave up half his fortune away, I would probably believe him. You know, next year, believe him. well, in the sense that the guy says, this year, I'm going to, I'm so generous, I'm going to give half my money away. So the guy's got, I don't know, $500 billion. He's going to give $250 billion of his own money and just send it out, right? He's no longer the owner of that money. <laughs> it never happened. It never happened, never will. Because he can't continue his business. No, he, he can give that money away. He could do a lot of good. I don't know good because when you give money away, you do good and bad. You yeah, do a little bit of everything and we're all aware of that. Exactly but, this, this is, but this is my point. My point is dumb. if the guy promises to do something like that and actually does it, then maybe I would believe him because now he's no longer the richest guy in the world. Maybe he falls to number 20 or, or 100. <laughs> I've never seen that. I've you, never seen that. You know the joke of the father giving his son um, uh, advice for the future? He says, uh -huh. uh, you need two things. Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, with the truth and wisdom. And he tells them, truth yeah. always come through on a promise. If you promise, uh, e even if you lose your whole business, no matter what, always come through on a promise. And what about wisdom, Father? <laughs> and the Father tells them, wisdom to never make a promise. <laughs> Especially that he can't keep, or that he doesn't want to keep. Yeah, something like that.